Callie Cox, welcome to the Long Term Investor. Hey, Peter, excited to be here. It's excited to talk about you know these crazy markets. Well, it was important to me to record with you not too far into the year had gotten started because we just had a huge rally in the fourth quarter of 2023 after seeing markets decline maybe 10-ish percent um, mid-year. And you know, as of the time we're recording this, we'll put a timestamp on it. It's January 9th, 2024. Market sentiment remains relatively positive right this moment. So, you know, maybe why don't we start with you giving a little of your thoughts on what happened during this market turnaround in the fourth quarter? Well, that's a good place to start because in many people's minds, I feel like that was such a pivotal turning point in both portfolios, in Fed policy, and I mean, like you said, Peter, in market prices in both stock and crypto markets. So, you know, around the end of October, I think stocks bottomed or the S&P bottomed October 27th, maybe. Um, that was a few days before the Fed meeting. And in that Fed meeting, Powell, Chair Powell made it so clear that, you know, the Fed and the Fed never makes promises, let me be clear, but the Fed, that the Fed was getting really close to being uh, at the end of rate hikes. And we heard a lot of encouraging language on the progress um, that the Fed has made on inflation. Of course, inflation prices are still high. Um, they're probably not coming down anytime soon. I've said an economic crisis that you don't want. But uh you know, the Fed looks at the uh, growth in inflation, the growth in prices, and that pace of growth has come down steadily since the middle of last year. So markets really heard that. And quite honestly, Powell has told us in some ways or another since July that we were getting close to the end of the rate hike cycle. Uh, but the way that he worded it in November, um, how he talked about the balance of risks, how he talked about the progress in inflation. Um, I think there was one reporter that even asked him if the rate height cycle was over and he dodged the question a little bit, <laughs> which markets took as, you know, you don't want to answer it. Come on. Like, we, we hear you. Uh, it, I just think that the, the shift in tone was big enough that people started pricing in rate cuts. And you have to remember too, that at the beginning of October and throughout October, the concern was another inflation spike and you know the rise we saw in the 10 year yield up to 5%. So I think it was a combination of people being way on the wrong side of the boat and then Powell coming out and being so flexible with his language and so encouraging on inflation and the economy, economy that we saw People rushed to the other side so quickly, and that turned into a 15% rally in the fourth quarter. Well, and I think an interesting piece of context that I'm often repeating myself in sharing on this ep in this show is that you know, stock returns, if you go back and look at what they're comprised of, they're comprised of changes in earnings, um, changes or uh, the cash flow paid to shareholders, whether that's dividends or buybacks, in changes in valuation, which is in many ways a sentiment gauge. And so you know, hearing some of the things that you're sharing, do you feel like in this rally that the economy actually improved or is this all just kind of a turnaround in sentiment? Well, you have to remember the market is forward looking and you're absolutely right. That is what stock returns are made up of. It's, um, I would word it as, you know, the fundamentals, of course, the profits driven by the economy with a dash of hope in there. And the hope, uh, like you were talking about, Peter, is the valuations. That's the part of the market where you say, okay, things might not be great right now, but investors are willing to look in the future. And this is, you know, they see profits improving by this much over the next six to 12 months. That, I think that's what's caught people off guard. I mean, valuations are quite high right now. But we've seen such a dramatic repricing of the future too, especially since that end of October timeframe, that yes, it does look like valuations are, or have driven this rally. Um, you know, they've driven much of the bull market that we've seen since October, 2022. But at the same time, we're staring at a year where profits could grow 10% year over year, you know, if Wall Street is right. So yes, we've seen a lot of growth in valuations. I think you could, you know, compare that to sentiment, but of because of course, to feel better about the, econ the economy, you have to feel something, you have to have some sort of positioning. Um, but you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think valuations are really tricky, especially in this environment. And a lot of people look at history and they get thrown off guard by what valuations are telling us. Well, and because at least to me, valuations is this mix of calculus and psychology that's constantly changing you know, the things that drive stock returns, that's always going to be the hardest to predict. And I also think something that is not terribly unusual, but certainly notable catching a lot of headlines is the fact that we're near all time highs. 
um, but not all stocks have done well. And in fact, uh, you actually wrote an article for the Financial Times stating that 72% of S&P 500 stocks underperformed in 2023, whereas one third of S&P 500 stocks were just down, had negative returns. Meanwhile, you have the Magnificent Seven, which for those listening, and I'm not gonna use their official names, I'm gonna use their known names. The Magnificent Seven is Apple, Google, <laughs> Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Tesla, NVIDIA. They averaged a return of 111% in 2023. The market's always a little bit top heavy, but what do you make of this specific trend? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't use their official names either. <laughs> um, that's not a choice I'm making. I just, I can't call Facebook, which is something I've been on since 2007, meta. I just can't Same. do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just ingrained in my brain. There's some, some psychology. I'm also you. never going to call Google uh, Alphabet, but I almost did right when I started listing them. So that goes <laughs> to tell you, maybe they're finally getting to me. Or Twitter X. Can't do never that one. We're going to do that. Nope. No. But okay, so talking about participation in the stock market last year, it was really wild. And the chart that you mentioned uh, of you know the stocks that underperformed the S&P last year, you're right. 72% of stocks underperformed the S&P. I think toward the end of the year, it was around 71, maybe. So not a big change. Um, but you know we had a historic number of stocks not doing as well as the market. And to me, that was made even crazier by the fact that, you know, I work for a retail brokerage. We talk to everyday investors all the time. And we were constantly hearing, you know, everybody says the stock market's up, the Dow was doing really well, but my portfolio sucks. What's going on? Um, you know, I'm not feeling these good vibes that everybody else is feeling. And this stat is the one stat that I think explains how people felt about market returns last year. Not about what we saw in the headlines, but how it actually translated to our portfolios. Um, yeah, and one third of stocks were down as well. So I've, I think of this a few ways, you know, to the customers who talk to us and say, like, I, I just don't see a bull market in my portfolio. Totally, I hear you. The numbers back you up there. Um, I think that this is also such a good example of investing in a high rate environment because when rates are high and capital is scarce, investors have to make tough decisions. They can't invest in everything. They pick one stock over the other. And that's exactly what we saw in 2023. Um, you know, that, that gravitational pull toward quality risk, toward those companies that people thought could survive a recession because the recession worries were real. And those companies happen to be, you know, some of the biggest on the market. That's big tech right there. So um, I was surprised at how much uh, feedback I got on that chart. Um, it was a popular chart on social media. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think it resonated with a lot of people who said, "Hmm, I'm not crazy." You know, <laughs> you know, this market didn't feel like a bull market, but uh, you know, then again, it wasn't a bull market for most stocks. So, uh, you know, I think coming out of that, we could be set up, set up for a really good year ahead, um, a year of more broad participation, a year that doesn't hurt so bad in your portfolio if you are a stock picker. Uh, but, you know, we live in interesting times right now. And I think people also have to remember that high rates, even if we see a few rate cuts here and there, rates could remain relatively high. So you could see a little bit of that weirdness matriculate into 2024. Well, that's some, I'll be sure to share some links to that original work in the charts. And when you po post it on Twitter, um, in the show notes at the longtermainvestor.com, the magnificent driving, excuse me, the magnificent seven that they're driving these returns, that people are gravitating towards a set of names almost in the sense that they perhaps seem less risky to me would mean, you know, if you're expecting it to be less risky, shouldn't you be expecting a lower return? And I know there's a lot of data out there showing how the performance of stocks that are in the top 10 holdings, they ultimately outperform on their way to being a top 10 holding. That's sort of the point, a little bit intuitive. But after they become a top 10 holding, historically, their performance has trailed the overall market. So I think people are getting frustrated by seeing these same seven names should know one, it's not that historically unusual for just a couple of names to drive all the returns Two, it's not that unusual for the top 10 stocks to represent a large portion of the index. Now, it is a little bit higher today than it has been historically, but there's usually a lot of concentration at the top anyways. And then three that you know, chasing what's won in the past hasn't necessarily paid off. And I think something you were saying 
about your your customers saying, hey, I didn't experience the bull market in my portfolio, just shows the difficulty of, of picking individual stocks. And so that's super interesting, Callie. And I think that I can share, first of all, that chart that you were referencing in the show notes at the longtermainvestor.com. And I often hear about the Magnificent Seven from clients, from families, from friends, really kind of pointing out like these are just doing so much better than everything else. Shouldn't I just go into these because they are feeling a little more certain, a little less risky to which I tend to think if you're if it's supposed to be less risky, why would you expect it to have a higher return? If, if anything, you'd expect it to have a lower return. And the data is pretty compelling. Historically, stocks on their way to becoming a top 10 holding uh, within the S&P 500 outperform. That's how they become the biggest companies. And then after reaching that part, they've historically underperformed. You know, that's one thing that sticks out to me this, you know, it's not that unusual that a lot of stocks underperform the S&P 500. It's not unusual that just a handful of stocks make up for all the returns, whether it's in the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000. It's not all that unusual for the top stocks to make up a large percentage of the index, even if it is a little bit higher today than it has been in the past. But I do think one of the things that kind of is interesting sticks out, you said, you you're the retail investor says, Hey, the bull market didn't really happen in my portfolio. I know Lizzie and Saunders dating back to the pandemic said, I don't know that we'll have a recession, but you'll see these rolling recessions impacting pockets of the economy. I don't know if you have any thoughts about the magnificent seven or any of that with the rolling recessions that, that you could share with us. Yeah. You gave me a lot of things to think about there. So Sorry, first yeah, of just all, kind of rambling. It's exact- an interesting topic. Oh, it's it's a very interesting topic, and I have lots of thoughts on it too. Um, you know, the first thing I'll say is that you know many people don't know how the stock market works, and that's not to anybody's fault. Uh, no, we're not taught about this in schools. Um, you know, I actually didn't start investing until I was probably four or five years in my career because it's just not it's not an intuitive ecosystem, right? Parts of it are intuitive, others just don't make sense, and one part of it that I think throws people off is the kind of guise of momentum. You know, if these stocks are doing well, they're probably just going to do well forever, right? Um, And that's not the case. Companies change, market environments change, investor preferences change. And you're right, usually, you know, a few stocks drive the market higher. Um, That's not abnormal, although it was a little more unusual this past year how concentrated the returns are were in the top 10. you know, companies change over time, so market leadership changes, and often what leads a bull market, uh, what often what leads one bull market, uh, doesn't lead the bull market the next time around. Which, if you think about what led the 2010s bull market, that was big tech. So I'm thinking a lot about that these days. Uh, but also how you experience that in your portfolio, the the conversation between picking stocks here and there, which has its pros and cons, versus you know, just throwing it all in a basket of stocks, index investing, like many of us know. So, I mean, one thing I'll add to kind of get into this deeper is that, you know, many retail investors did own the Magnificent Seven. Uh, If you think about the top owned stocks on our platform, um, I don't have a list in front of me, but I can almost guarantee the top seven, the Magnificent Seven are in the top 10. So some investors had a good year. Other investors didn't have a good year. If you were a value investor, God help you, you probably had an awful year. Uh, But, you know, things change. And going into this year, you know, I think big tech told us something very important last year. Um, They were, big tech was the place where investors ran to hide. Um, That's not the big tech that we knew in the 2010s, the innovators, the, you know, small but punching above their weight type companies. Uh, Big tech just looks different. So when I think about big tech, I think about the next chapter for them and the fact that many of them are bigger conglomerate companies that have their hands in a lot of cookie jars, a lot of business lines. So it makes sense that they look a little more defensive. The flip side to that, though, is that they may not be the bull market leaders because, as you said, in order to lead a market, you have to outperform. Defensive stocks uh, usually don't outperform the market, especially in a bull market. So, you know, if you're a big tech investor, if you hold those stocks, I just, you know, keep your mind on, you know, how these companies are changing, how the stock profile is changing and think long and hard about 2023 and why big tech did well. People were worried about a recession. They gravitated toward that financial strength. That was big tech. 
But if the animal spirits come back, if people have bigger appetites for risk, they might look at other companies. They might look at some of these startups that are about to come on the market. They might look at you know, private companies that are expecting to flip public. Um, there could be another pocket that gets the good graces of the bull market. You know, if you asked me right now, I'd say manufacturing looks really interesting. The reshoring theme looks really interesting. Um, industrials, especially with um, all the progress we've seen overseas, uh, with you know certain you know companies coming up to speed in technology, could be really interesting. So. You know, different pockets outperform no matter what time period you're in. Um, I think big tech could be one of the big surprises of this bull market. Um, I'm not saying they're all going to crash, but they may not be the market <laughs> leaders that we expect them to be. I find myself saying that often to people who are what I feel like are overly enthusiastic about the space saying like, hey, I don't see these going bankrupt, but it's hard to keep up that growth rate. And I started my career as a stock analyst and it reminds me of General Electric, you know, the classic diversified industrial. Mm -hmm. It's not, they're completely different business lines, but when you do start getting to your word, use your words and your hands in different cookie jars, it's just harder to move the needle. Um, and, and that was obviously a big theme of last year, continuing to be a storyline this year, but another big storyline I'd like your thoughts on are just all of the money going into money market funds. What do you think's going on there? Yeah, well, I want to <laughs> I want to talk about General Electric for a bit because I made that exact okay. comparison in a note I I wrote earlier last year around big tech. I mean, actually GE had a great year <laughs> last year, which is kind of ironic considering, you know, all the market forces we had to think about, but if you're thinking toward financial strength, maybe it makes sense. Um, anyway, I just thought it was funny that you brought up General Electric. That's funny. Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, I, I feel like I read everything you wrote in the last year, but I didn't go far back enough to, to capture that one. Great minds think alike, though, so this yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it's the quintessential conglomerate uh, that was on fire back in the day and then now does a thousand different things and is trying to shut them quickly to become a more nimble, small, focused company. So... Yeah, maybe big tech is heading there. But anyway, I kind of deflected the question there. Um, the dash to cash, the obsession with cash. Uh, yeah, I think it boils down to high rates, Peter. And I'd love to hear um, about what you're hearing from clients and other colleagues, because, you know, this is one of the most interesting dynamics that's come out of the year in my mind. We saw a stock, the stock market at large do really well. We saw the S&P rise 24%. But cash levels built up as well. So people were investing and they were also saving a lot of cash. Doesn't really make sense <laughs> if you think about it. Um, and that's not what we've seen in previous bull markets either. Usually well, over the past two bull markets, we've seen cash levels draw down quickly at the beginning of bull markets. And I think that's a signal of the rate environment we're in. Um, you know, we do this survey at eToro, it's called the Retail Investor Beat Survey. We survey investors all around the globe, um, asking them what they're investing in, what they're thinking about. Um, I look at the US cut, uh, but we do have a broader global operation, of course, so we like to look at different countries. Um, but one thing that really jumped out to me is that investors see cash as more of an opportunity. They see the high rates and they say, you know, I don't know how long I can get 5% on a savings account, so I'm taking advantage of that, especially because I'm feeling uneasy about what's going on in the world around me. So, hey, if I could get a relatively riskless 5%, then why not? Um, I'm sure, I mean, that's a very broad statement, and I'm sure that there are many Americans who are saving money for a house down payment, for example, um, saving up their emergency fund because they really are worried about the economy or, God forbid, they're out of a job. But we see this large swath of investors that are saying, you know, I'm building up cash because I want that interest rate. And, you know, I actually feel great about the economy. You know, I feel great about my finances and my prospects, but I can't ignore that interest rate. And, you know, it gives you a lot to think about as you head into a year where, you know, that interest might, rate might not stay around for very long. Now, I can't prove what I'm going to say, but there's a part of me that thinks a lot of the flows came from people who are keeping large balances in sweep accounts or checking accounts that weren't earning anything. Obviously, not enough to move a trillion dollars over the course of a year like we saw, but it is interesting. There are periods of time when the yield curve makes it such that cash is the best yielding thing you can get, bonds, stocks, otherwise. You and I both know long term, if we're thinking a 10 or 20 year horizon, and you have the choice of sticking money in cash and not being able to get to it for 20 years or stick it in the market for 20 years, you know, the likelihood that 
long-term money in stocks outperforms cash is, is really, really good. But kind of honing in on something you said where people feel a little bit nervous, that, that's been my, my big take. Here's a certain return. Cash is, it, it makes the bar higher for taking risk. I mean, that's literally what the Fed's trying to do <laughs> anyways when they raise rates. So mm-hmm. job well done to the Fed. You know, I, I notice in a lot of what you publish, though, you seem to have a pretty optimistic tilt, which I like. I think anytime you're in this business, you can recognize that bad things will happen. Being an optimist doesn't mean that you're ignoring the bad things. It just recognizes how amazing human society is at creating and making things better and the emotions that draw drive it like greed and wanting more. You had sort of mentioned manufacturing as a spot of a uh, bright spot, but I'm kind of curious, you know, what has you optimistic going into 2024 about the economy, about markets in general? Well, I, th- I think if you're honest with yourself and you study the history of the stock market and of the U.S. economy and of U.S. history, quite frankly, it's hard not to be an optimist. Um, you know, for me, it really boils down to the stock market being a call option on human progress. Um, and I know you can't say that about other global markets, but at least in the U.S., this has been true. I mean, yes, we go through crises. Yes, you know, we've been through, I think, 13 economic recessions since the 1950s. Um, 10 or 11 bear markets, uh, countless pullbacks of 10% or more, yet the s and is up an average of 8% annually over that period. And there's a reason for that, right? You know, like life, you run into obstacles, you hit crises, but you know, like most humans do, we figure out a way to get through it and we ultimately come out of it stronger. I mean, necessity is the mother of inven- invention after all. So I think that's really where my optimistic attitude comes from. It's from the numbers telling me that, but also from the fact that you know, you, you can't just look at the world in front of you, right? You have to think about where we're going and you have to realize that there are certain trends and truths that you can kind of lean on day by day. Like we will hit crises. Um, the economy won't be infallible all the time, but we will find a way to get through that. And most likely that will be reflected in profits, which is ultimately re- reflected in the stock market. Uh, I think about that a lot, um, especially because, you know, I have friends who I talk to about the stock market and I almost want to ask them to draw a picture of how it's performed over the past few decades. And I'm sure it would be down and to the right. But if you look at it, it, it's just up and up and up with these, you know, random blips here and there. So um, I digress there. But, you know, when I'm thinking about what I'm optimistic about next year, you know, what could drive this bull market? I mean, I think AI is the obvious conversation point here for both, you know, a macro analyst and a micro analyst. you know, NVIDIA was actually uh, one of the few stocks that we saw translate AI into profits last year, or excuse me, not profits yet, sales. Um, <laughs> sales, definitely. Uh, which was really encouraging because, you know, with these, um, with these young stories, with these you know, themes that we're watching, the big question is, will it actually matter? Is it just all hype? Or is this actually going to translate into profits for corporate America and efficiencies for your daily life? And so far for AI, that answer is yes, from what we're seeing. And you know, going into 2024, I think the AI trade could broaden out into industries that are tangential to AI technology or that benefit from AI technology, but aren't those, you know, big tech uh, companies or semiconductors that we've all been talking about. Um, And you're right too, manufacturing, I mean, the reshoring that we've seen, um, the factory construction spending that we've seen over the past year, um, I believe factory construction spending was up 60% in either November or December, which is one of the biggest year over year gains we've seen on record, uh, which blows my mind because you think about manufacturing, you see that as the old economy, you know, the America that we knew back in the 50s, 60s and 70s, not necessarily now, but it's all coming back because of reshoring and different policy initiatives. And, you know, these are the trends that are happening underneath our feet. This is what drives, this is what will drive portfolios in the years ahead. I think it's so interesting, the fact that you have all this access to investor data, behavior, sentiment, I mentioned earlier, or maybe you had mentioned the retail investor beat survey that was uh, actually coming out probably uh, just right after this recording. Could you talk a little bit about what the survey is? And even though I gave a little introduction to eToro in um, 
before bringing you on the show, maybe you could talk a little bit about your customer base and the background. Then maybe we can dive into some of those results. Sure, sure. So I love talking about eToro. I've been with eToro since December of 21. Uh, eToro is a big global brokerage. We're very well known in Europe. We're based in Tel Aviv. Um, and our ethos is basically that you know investors can use their money however they want. We want to give them the education and tools so that they can make the best decisions. Um, so we really pride our, ourselves on offering you know a bevy of products to investors so they can build the kinds of portfolios they want with a certain kind of transparency because we are a social investing app that allows them to see how other investors are performing, what they're investing in, you know, what they think about certain stocks and crypto and investments that they're making. Um, you know, it all goes back to giving them the facts they need to make the smartest investments. Uh, eToro started in the U.S. in 2018, uh, so we're a five-year-old brokerage here in the U.S. Um, we offer stocks, crypto, and options. Uh, we're very well known for our crypto offering, uh, and you know, we're doing lots of really cool things. I'm building a research product there. We have lots of great education and videos on stocks, ETFs, uh, options, crypto. Um, you can go to eToro's website to find all of that. Um, but we have 2 million registered accounts here in the US. And uh, yeah, we're looking at, you know, a couple good years ahead of us. Um, and yeah, one of the things you mentioned, we do the Retail Investor Beat survey. It's a quarterly survey. We survey investors all across the globe, um, asking them what they're investing in, what they're seeing in the economy, um, what they're expecting to do with their money in the future. And every time I get the results, I am shocked by some of the details we hear. So what are the vibes out there? What has you surprised right now? What are the vibes? So I am so proud of the everyday investor. Investors have stayed consistently invested throughout the bear market and into this bull market. I'm not quite sure why that surprises me. You know, when you think about it, the fact that the job market is so strong is probably one of the pillars of the fact that people are invested because on a very basic level, if you're making money, you're probably spending it or investing it. I mean, you're spending it, investing it, saving it. There, there's like a finite number of things you can do with it. If you feel good about the future, you're probably investing it. Add to the fact that investing is more accessible than ever and the conversation around in investing really picked up around COVID. And it's led to a cohort of investors who have kind of held the line. They're trading less these days compared to 2021, no surprise there, but they haven't really sold out and run away. They've you know stayed invested and you know tried to think strategically in an environment where there are high rates and inflation. Um, the biggest thing that stuck out to me in this past survey that we did, and I think we conducted it the last week of November and the first week of December, so right in the middle of that strong Q4 rally um, that we were in the middle of, uh, a lot of investors told us that they are still building up cash. Um, they're doing it opportunistically, like I said earlier, but younger investors, uh, investors 44 and younger, were the ones that told us more often than not that they were building up cash to take advantage of those interest rates. When I think of, so I started in the job market in 2007, just before the crash. And the you know, S&P 500 lost, let's say 60-ish percent over 18 months. And all I could think throughout that period in the years that followed were, man, I wish I had cash when the market was down a lot. And every time I started to build a little bit of cash, I thought, gosh, I'm not earning any mm -hmm. interest on this. I might as well invest it. It really does change the calculus when you can sit there have the flexibility that you have in cash, even if it's not formally an emergency fund, even if it's, hey, it's liquidity, I'll use it opportunistically. And in the meantime, I'm not just passing up returns. It, it really is perhaps a different era for a lot of investors. I mean, again, doing this long enough where my whole career is based on zero, zero yields. Um, it changes the calculus, it changes the emotions, changes all of it. And it looks like, you know, this was really true for people in their 30s and your 40s, like you're saying. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, and one thing I'll point to, too, is that a lot of us are new investors. I mean, millennials are really getting into their economic power right now. They're forming households. They're finally making enough money so that, that they have money to invest. Um, they're making pro progress on their student loans. Many have seen them forgiven. So we are young investors, but that doesn't mean that we have little experience in markets. I mean, one thing that I think back on is the fact that a lot of us graduated after the financial crisis, right? Like I was lucky enough to graduate right after it. Um, but at a point where the job market was a little bit stronger, people were feeling a little bit better. 
But we felt the financial crisis, even if we were in high school and middle school and college when it happened. I mean, both my parents lost their jobs during the financial crisis. I felt the financial crisis. So the feelings and the experience are there. It's just a little bit different than, oh, I opened up my eToro account or my Schwab account and my portfolio has gotten hammered and, you know, I got the pink slip the next day and I was laid off. So, you know, a lot of these younger investors have that experience. They know how markets work. I mean, buy the dip is a trending mantra among millennials and Gen Z right now. So they have the tools they need to be more opportunistic and sophisticated in their investing strategies, and they're finally getting the money to do it. Uh, you know, I really think people underestimate and discount, you know, how much investors or younger investors have been through, um, and how resilient they've been and fortified they are to take on what they're seeing these days. Yeah, every generation is going to have their version of why they had it toughest. But I do think that younger investors, you know, your survey data is showing that they're feeling more confident than older investors. And a lot of that speaks to when you're younger, you're optimistic about the future, you got more human capital ahead of you. But they have been through enough downturns to know that to earn a good return, you have to live through some bad stuff. Um, perhaps that's no more true in a place like crypto, where I know that you guys have a big presence. Um, I'm kind of curious before we sign off to get your thoughts on some of the headlines around a spot price Bitcoin ETF coming to market. I think that there, I've done a lot of blog articles, podcasts on holding crypto directly on the existing products that are out there. But I think when it becomes easier, you'll see a lot of new investors maybe throw some money thinking, hey, this really does track it. What are some things you would tell people who have no crypto experience? when they see that they can buy spot price Bitcoin in an ETF and don't really know what they're doing, what are some things that you think they need to keep in mind? Yeah, well, I'll remind everybody that we're recording this on January 9th. Uh, the big speculation is that we're going to get ETF approvals tomorrow, but who knows when you're listening to this, it, we may or may not have them, who knows? Um, in two yeah, weeks, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I won't give my predictions, but I think it's looking pretty good. Um, but yeah, we have all these headlines around Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, we got a lot of details yesterday because we saw the S1s of um, the Bitcoin ETFs that are up for approval right now, which really, it, it made it real to me as an analyst because I got to see the details. We got to see the fees. Um, it, it feels like I'm actually seeing an ETF right in front of me. Um, so, and we've gotten questions about it at eToro for months now. Um, it It really has been... You know, even before the grayscale decision, court decision happened in August, there's been speculation about a Bitcoin ETF and the grayscale decision made it real. And then the speculation hyped up even more toward the end of the year for good reasons. And now we're here. So, you know, as it looks like we're on the eve of a Bitcoin ETF approval, um, you know, I think it could obviously open the door up to a lot of investors who were skeptical, skept skeptical about crypto to begin with. Um, in that retail investor beat survey that I told you about, we have a question that we ask from time to time. It's, you know, of course, do you invest in crypto? But if, if you don't invest in crypto, why don't you invest in it? And a lot of people unsurprisingly tell us the volatility of crypto. I can't handle the swings. I don't have the risk appetite for that. Um, but two of the top three reasons are usually the accessibility of it. I don't know how to buy it. Don't ask me. <laughs> or the transparency. I don't know what I'm investing in. Like, why would I put my money in something I know nothing about? And I think the Bitcoin ETF over time could solve those two issues right there. A lot of people are familiar with an ETF. That's a very familiar wrapper in the US, you know. Um, a lot of brokerages don't offer crypto, but they offer ETFs. I mean, if I'm a customer at one of the bigger brokerages, you know, I probably have to keep my crypto in a separate account. However, if a Bitcoin ETF is approved, you know, I can see all my money in one account. There are huge behavioral advantages to that. Um, and it just makes your life easier. Uh, and I mean, you can tell me you're in the financial advisor space. I've heard that this could be a big boon for clients who want to put, you know, crypto in their retirement accounts, who want to work crypto into their financial plans, but, you know, haven't really quite taken the leap because it, it hasn't felt familiar to them. So, you know, I'm feeling really good. I think it'll open up the, the world to crypto a little bit more. Um, I want to note, I'm not a crypto maxi. Um, I am a crypto optimist, but I'm also a skeptic because I'm an analyst. Um, and I think that there are a lot of really good storylines going on in crypto, especially in Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
Uh, but again, it's a risky investment. Like you can't deny that. And it's one that you have to really, you know, keep check on your goals and your risk tolerance about. So, you know, I'm interested in hearing from you though. I mean, is your side of the industry, the financial advisors, the planners, how are they feeling about it? Well, I feel like I hear a lot of differing viewpoints from different advisors, different thought leaders in the space. I, I feel like I've been pretty consistent in everything that I published that the very last thing that you said is the most important, which is just understanding why you're owning it. Like what is the goal and purpose? Because mm -hmm. if you, there are no financial plans that we build that require you to own an asset that goes completely bonkers in order for the financial plan to work. So I think when you set that aside and understand the motivations, that's one piece. I think a lot of the use case for Bitcoin, it actually being currency that will replace the US dollar has largely been debunked. I know there's some real strong believers out there that have an agenda, but ultimately to me, the thing it reminds me most of is uh, generally gold. I mean, when I talk to someone who is overly passionate about gold, they sound just like the laser eyes. I thought the laser eyes and the gold bugs must be relatives. Um, I don't think it's bad to own it. It seems like it's like good diversification owns things that move in different directions. I don't know that I'll ever own it. I don't own, know that I won't own it. Um, but it's, it's been a pretty consistent viewpoint there. I think when I first wrote about it in 2017, I think I had the viewpoint of it's either going to be worth a ton or nothing. And you know what? At this level, I would say this is worth a ton relative to where it was back then. I don't know. It, a lot of people say Bitcoin 100,000. Yeah, that would also be a ton. Um, but over $40,000 relative mm -hmm. to it being in the hundreds of dollars is a ton. So it's survived longer than I thought. I will admit that. Um, I'm perfectly fine saying I don't know what will come of it. But most of what I tell people is understand the why. And I do think the accessibility will stir up more interest again usually by the time that we worked with clients um with how it would work and getting into it they say oh never mind i don't want to do this and you know when you i think it's if, if it's not like gold the other thing i kind of compare it to is just picking individual stocks which i have no problem with people having a portion of their net worth in individual stocks why they have it can differ sometimes it can be just interesting or a hobby other people think they really are better at stock picking than just owning the entire market. Whatever the reason is fine, particularly when you get into the different coins. I feel like if you like one coin better than another, it's not all that different than making a bet on Amazon um, or a bet on Apple or whatever. So I'm excited just to see what happens tomorrow um, and in the coming weeks in part because I just find markets interesting and investing interesting and any innovation in the space likely leads to other good things. I, I would say there's some innovations like reverse uh, leveraged ETFs that uh, inverse, you know, leveraged ETFs that that doesn't help too many people other than traders. I don't see the Bitcoin ETF really harming people's lives once it's out there. Yeah, totally. And I think you hit the nail on the head right now. You really have to go back to your why. In fact, I was talking to a colleague today uh, about Bitcoin's price movement and what it could do after the ETFs are approved, you know, if it's a sell the news moment or if it's a buy more Bitcoin. And to be clear, over the long term, if this really does open up the door to more demand, that could put a foundation under the price and, of course, lead to higher prices. Markets, when you boil it down, are a function of supply and demand. But, you know, I was talking to her and I had the same thing run through my head because I hold Bitcoin in my portfolio, but I have a set percentage that I basically, I, I rebalance my portfolio to. Um, I asset allocate like many other people. And I was like, look, I'm tempted to cut some too. I'm tempted to take my profits, but you know, my crypto allocation is still way off of its target. So, I mean, that's where your why really comes into place and you don't have to do these sanity checks of, you know, is 47K where it tops out? You know, should I, sold it, should I have sold at 45K? Have I missed my chance? Tie it to something you can control. You know, have your numbers out there, have your targets, have your allocations, make all of your decisions based on that. Take the emotions out of it. Um, unless you like that, unless you find some interest in, you know, following markets day by day, some people do. But uh, I think crypto is such a good, uh, almost example of 
why targets are important and why your why is crucial. Well, Callie, it has been a pleasure speaking with you here today. I'm going to include a lot of stuff in the show notes at the longterminvestor.com, but for people listening or watching, if they want to hear more from you, where can they find you? Yeah, so first of all, go to etoro.com backslash news and analysis. Uh, all of our research goes there. We have a daily note from my fabulous analyst, Brett Kenwell, on uh, trades of the day and market movers. Uh, I write a weekly note called The Bottom Line that you can subscribe to on LinkedIn. Uh, and then I'm on Twitter. Uh, etoro is also on Twitter at etoro US. Uh, I'm at Cali A Bost, B O S T. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. I'm trying to get more familiar with that platform. Uh, and it's been awesome, you know, talking with you, Peter. There's so much to talk about these days. Well, we'll have to have you back uh, as things develop. I appreciate your time as always. And if you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app, be sure to leave a review. Tell us what you think of Cali. Tell us what you think of the crypto ETF. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, be nice in the comment section. Let us know what you love. Like and subscribe. And until next time, to long-term investing. 